I'm Mike Vardy. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it, and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. And this is the Productivityist Podcast. Welcome to the Productivity is Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and this week on the show, I'm excited to bring you Brad Zup. He is an entertaining motivational speaker and a memory improvement expert from New York. He shows people how to supercharge their memories to improve many aspects of their lives, including productivity and to have a better memory at any age. And that's one of the big reasons I want to talk to him is the fact I trust my memory but only to a point. And that's because I'm a big believer in that your mind is meant to be a factory, not a warehouse. And so I wanted to hear his take on this and dive into how we can kind of reconcile what we should try to retain by memory and what we should capture, uh, what we should memorize versus what we shouldn't, what you can do to keep your memory from fading, how a calendar and other tools can kind of help enhance your memory. Uh, and so much more. So this is a really cool conversation uh, with Brad Zup that I had not too long ago, recorded exclusively for you, the Productivity is Podcast listener. So let's just dive into it. Here is my conversation with Brad Zup on the Productivity is Podcast. I'd like to welcome Brad Zup to the Productivity is Podcast. Brad, thanks for joining me this week. Thanks for having me, Mike. So memory. Now, this is a big thing for me when it comes to productivity. It almost is, in a lot of ways, in my my estimation, I want you to set me straight on this, or at least maybe guide me a little bit more on this, because my my process is that we tend to, especially when it comes to our tasks and when it comes to the things that, that we th- we need to do, in my experience, we tend to trust it too much. And, and maybe that's because... It's just, it's the default. It's the thing that's most accessible to us. Our brain is the, it, I mean, it's, it's not an accessory that we need to, need to pack up or charge before we leave, or we got to make sure that we've got a, a, a spare one in our jacket pocket before we leave. So pe- people tend to, th- <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people tend to think that they'll remember the things that they need to do and then rely solely on memory instead of, you know, doing the, the tried and true method in terms of productivity of getting it out of their head and uh, into some place they trust. Now, isn't that a, problem and if so like how do you how do you deal with that how do you help people deal with that problem well it's interesting take on it because i see i I certainly see that with some things but i see more people not relying on their memory and having to jot everything down to get it out of their heads because they don't trust their minds though i do see some people going okay i'll have to remember that and I look at them and I go, you're not going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you should write that down. No, no, I got it. I got it. And uh, I think I think that happens a lot with uh, our partners and spouses. Oh, yeah. OK, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop and get the milk. Yeah. Or, OK, yeah, we got it. We got to go to the mother-in-law's house. OK, yeah, I got it. Should we put it on the calendar? No, 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 we got it. Right. We got it. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> and then the mother-in-law calls and says, you know, we're at the restaurant. Are you on your way? Oh yeah, we're just running a little late. Oh my gosh, we forgot. <laughs> so I see it. I see it both ways, and it's a problem both ways. Because say you 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 think you're going to forget, and then you blank out on it. Obviously, that's bad. Uh, on the other hand, it's bad when we say, "Oh, I've got to remember that meeting," and we have to stop 
and get out of the moment of the conversation we're with, or, or with the, whoever we're with, or doing whatever, and take our focus away. And instead, you know, now we're multitasking because instead of doing the one thing, now we're going, okay, I'm doing the one thing, but I need to write this down because it just popped into my head. Um, and then we rely on our smartphones and we rely on just lists or apps, which serve a purpose. But at the same time, when we outsource our memory, our memory gets weaker. And when it gets weaker, we it's because it's not being exercised. And when it's not being exercised, we realize that and we go, ooh, my, I don't know if I can trust my memory. So we outsource more and it's kind of a downward spiral. So I think it maybe depends on which type of person you know, we are. Are we a person that says, you know, I can't function without talking into my phone and saying, here's a reminder, set a reminder, or jotting down on my to-do list or jotting down on a sticky note or writing it on my hand? Or are we the type of person that says, no, 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 I've, I've got that. I'll totally remember that when our memory isn't as good as we hope it will and we're constantly forgetting things. Now, when it comes to this, though, I, I think it's interesting is that I like, I mean, I, I've, when I was uh, doing theater, um, and even before then, I was lauded for my memory. I was, you know, like, wow, this guy can memorize stuff. But then what happened was, is I wasn't just being the actor up there. Uh, all of a sudden, I was being the producer, the director, <laughs> the writer. And the first thing that went out the window was I try, I relied on my memory. I said, oh, I, I've, been, I've been so good with memorizing lines that that won't be an issue for me. Um, and I took it for granted. And all of a sudden, I would get on stage and I'd lose my lines uh, again, my improv training helped, but all my actor colleagues were like, okay, Mike's drop." Like there was, it became the point where they said, you know, that director's clipboard you have, you should bring it on stage with you. Like that's literally the point it got to. And so it, it was disconcerting because what would happen is I, I was so good with that and I was losing it. So what are the warning signals that people should pay attention to when they, when their memory is either failing them or they're not paying enough attention to, um, exercising it, for lack of a better term. I think certainly when the people around us start saying things like, you should bring that clipboard, or, or hey, hey, honey, why don't you write that down? Or uh, I think we can tell when the people we work with, whether clients or colleagues or prospects or managers, for some reason something changes it's up to us to kind of sit back and say, oh, yeah, I've been really spacey lately. And I think that brings us to the, the three steps to remembering. See, when I first got into this, I just thought, well, I've, I've got a bad memory. Uh, I'm getting older and I'm just forgetting things. Uh, I guess that's just the way it is. We, we forget things as we get older. Oh, woe is me. It's just you know, the, na the nature of life. Can't do anything about it. But what I've found is that remembering is a three-step process. We have to get the information. Then we have to go up the next step. We have to save the information. Then we have to go up the next step and we have to get the information back. And then we're at the top when we remember. And I think too many people try to do too many things at once, multitask. They never get the memory. And if you get the memory, if you're really focused, if you're using time blocks or if you're time blocking your, your days and saying, okay, today's my learning day or whatever – it's a lot easier to get the information. But then we get it because we're really paying attention. But no one in school teaches us how to save it in a way that makes sense. So we're just kind of relying on our natural memory and our, our focus and attention. And that works for the most part. But when we're, when we're trying to go above and beyond, when we're trying to be productive and trying to get more done more quickly, better, grow, serve others – you know, we need to step it up a notch. And that's where we need to learn to, to save the information. And then some people have problems, not with the first two, but it's in there. They get the information, they save it, it's no problem. But in that spur of the moment, we get lost. And it's kind of like the expression, it's on the tip of my tongue. If you've mm. ever heard that or said that, it's kind of an older fashioned expression. But, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I, I, I just, uh, what's the name of that author? Uh, I just, got, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's in there somewhere and it's going away. So I think the first step is really figuring out which one of those steps we're having trouble with. It's, it's kind of like with anything in life, uh, physical fitness. I, mean, I know you've been working out and losing weight. You know, when we go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you need to get fit, that's a, that's a generality. 
when the doctor says you need to improve your cardiovascular fitness, then you know, okay, well, I need to jog or do aerobics or uh, bike or something that gets my, my lung capacity going. If you're, if you're older and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I'm worried about your fitness, you're over 60, you're female, I'm concerned about your bone strength, your doctor might suggest, you know, a, a light uh, weight workout to include, increase your bone density. So memory is the same thing. We need to look at like, well, where, where's the trouble coming from? And then come up with a specific fix based on that. Because if you have trouble with bone density because you're, uh, you know, an over 60 female, it might not make sense to take up a, a running regimen. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. One of the things that actually, as you're talking about students and, and, you know, when we're in school, I definitely want to dive into the younger ages because that's something I, I, I'm focusing on. And I know you do too and are, yes. and, and we'll talk about your, your book in a little bit, but I was reading Charles Duhigg's new book, Smarter, Faster, Better. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it yet, but he talks, I have not. he talks about a, uh, a, a phenomenon known as cre- disfluency. And one of the things that, that comes up is the example he uses is that when uh, students are – there was a study done where students were taking notes handwritten versus typing. And the study initially showed that the people who wrote it out, while they weren't able to write everything out because they can't write as quickly as, as they could type, they were scoring higher. They were learning more. And they were – they said that's not possible. They said we might be missing something. Let's do something different. And then what they did was is they did the same test, but they took the materials away from the students, both the laptop students and the, and the handwritten students. And the results were still the same, that the handwritten students were, were able to retain and had learned more than the typing students. So what I want to ask you here is, is there a – have you noticed a correlation, and maybe in your own work or with others, where the art of writing or, or, or pen to paper – is more effective for memory than, let's say, typing? Or is it a matter of just attention versus, uh, is, is attention usurping all of that, no matter what tools you use? Um, that's an interesting uh, comparison. And now for me, see, I, I go by the science and what I've read. I also go by what I've experimented with for myself. And I haven't done an experiment like that on myself. I know that for me, handwriting is better in some ways because it takes more time to write it out. So there's more time focusing on that. Typing for me, and, and it'd be interesting for me to, to read this study, I'm going to have to pick the book up, is you know, once, you're a, once you're a touch typist, you're not really thinking about what you're typing anymore. You're listening and your brain's communicating with your fingers and it's just just going. So I suspect that there's what you said, there's less focus, there's less attention on the process of, okay, I'm writing doubt smarter, faster, better, and I'm putting it in quotation marks and a book underneath it, which is what I did. And that that solidifies it more because I had to actually form those letters with with writing. And it's also in my handwriting. And the things that that mean more to us are going to stick better. Right. So I would love to see that done again with a handwriting font mm. uh, and also with younger kids who don't touch type and see if the the results vary at all. I'd also like to see what what I what I promote is mind mapping. I don't talk th- about this much in my presentations or it's not in my book, but uh, in my coaching clients, I have some people come to me and say, I need to learn this huge volume of data so I can become a registered investment advisor or my HR specialist. Okay, I have to do all these presentations to help people with their benefit packages. And I say, great, you know, let's sit down with the information and instead of like highlighting and making notes and underlying and putting stars in the in the in the margins, let's let's big picture it and do like each chapter in a in a circle and connect them with lines. And then maybe this one's bigger because it's more of a priority. And then we do underneath those we do lines and they're writing things out. And I prefer the the writing version as opposed to an app or a laptop version. 
And then we're color coding in them. We're adding colors. And, you know, okay, well, for, for this, for stocks, let's, let's write in blue. And for bonds, let's write in pink and all this stuff so that you can actually close your eyes and, and, and see maybe not each individual word, but you can see the big picture and the mind then can drill down and go, well, I know stock, I need to remember something about stocks and I know stocks are okay, blue and I think it was that third box down and that's enough to like get our brains going, oh yes, I've found the answer. Because I feel like we all have this almost like a memory detective, like a Sherlock Holmes mm. inside each of our minds and all the detective wants is to solve the case right. and impress whoever we work with, whether it's prospects or colleagues or our manager or spouse or our kids or grandkids. All they want to do is they, I want to solve the case for you. I want, to, I want to get this memory to impress you. And they're just begging us, provide me with just a few more clues and ways I can understand. And one of the ways that the mind likes a lot is the visual aspect. And that's why I suspect, long-winded answer, sorry, that the, the handwritten is better because, A, it's personal. It's my handwriting, so there's a little bit of more of an emotional connection there. It, I know what my writing looks like, so that visual is there. It's not just, you know, times uh, font on the screen. And I think it's great. That's, that's why I guess. So it's interesting. You mentioned um, this is one of the reasons why I love the idea of theming days and, and creating these sensory anchors or, or anchors or whatever you want to call it, or even memory anchors. I guess the sensory and memory, mm -hmm. they can kind of be somewhat interchangeable to a point, is that I don't have to remember everything on my list. It's just yes. – it's like it's like like you said. It's like a memory detective where I go, okay, today as, as we're recording this, it's Thursday. Thursday is my administrative day. Okay, so let me – what are my administrative tasks? Okay, oh, wait. These are my three things that I've flagged red. That means those are my three absolutes. So those are the things I absolutely need to do. And these orange ones mean they're important. And the yellow ones means they're repeating. And, oh, look, what mode – What okay, how do I feel right now? Okay, I feel like I am – have got – high energy because I've just finished talking to Brad and my energy levels have peaked. So let me look at all my deep work tasks that I can do that are under mm. the admin. And all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about the next thing on the list sequentially or chronologically or whatever. I'm thinking about it based on the clues that I have left myself from before, which which it's interesting you mentioned mind mapping. Uh, David Robinson, the my favorite basketball player of all time, just because of his integrity and how well he played as a as a center for the San Antonio Spurs. Um, he does his presentations and his talks just through mind maps. So he mm -hmm. mind maps his talks, and then he he remember obviously they're his triggers. They're his oh this is when this point is supposed to come up. And I love how you used color. We'll we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to talk a little bit more about. Um, by the way, when I was listening to the Duig book, I was notice I said listening to it. It was an audible version of the book, and I know that, uh, and I was able to recall that as you were talking to me about this because I think that one of the things you say in your blog post about developing a superhuman memory is that's one of the three things. And now maybe it wasn't me talking to myself; it was the narrator of the book talking to me, and then I retained it. But there are some elements that you talk about when it comes to having a superhuman memory, uh, you know, not just for 2016, but beyond that I think would be helpful to people. So why don't you share those with, uh, with our listeners? Cause some of them you may not think of much like regular productivity advice that people say, Oh, well I should multitask. And we talked about that before we recorded all the conventional things that often are a bit of a misnomer. You've got some here that are rather unconventional or you wouldn't think of first glance. Certainly. And well, let's start just at the at the beginning. We need to try to remember. Now, some people that flies in the face of what some people say, because in, in let me let me kind of delve into that a little bit more. So many of us don't even try to remember. And that's a problem because it, it's like not even trying to walk up the three flights of stairs, but using the ramp instead or using the elevator to go up one flight and never even trying to uh, walk because our, our memory declines. And that's just that's a that's a tricky thing. You know, it's it's kind of like going to the dentist. We need to. 
we need to take care of our teeth. We need to take care of our physical, you know, our bodies, our physicality, and we need to take care of our minds. And a lot of people just say, well, I got the email and I know I have an appointment next week. It's on my calendar. It's in my email. And I know it's with somebody about something, but I don't remember their name. And I don't need to because it's on the email and it's on my calendar. And an hour before the meeting, my phone or my my computer will, will ding and it'll pop up and say, you have a meeting with, with Mike. And I'll go, oh, yeah. Now, what's that about? Um okay, oh yeah, podcast, that's right. And what do I have to do to get ready for that? Instead, why don't we just try to remember? Now, I'm not saying remember every detail, uh, you know, the the website address and the phone number and, and things like that, but just trying to remember things just comes in so handy. And that's just, that's the biggest one. You've got to try. And another one is, to, we've talked about this, stop multitasking. I know you've talked about that extensively. It's shown over and over and over again by scientists that multitasking doesn't work. We're just splitting our focus and, and kind of like hitting, hitting the tab button to go through our windows or something. We, we hit it, we go to the next one, we hit it, we go to the next one, we hit it, we go to the next one. And the, the problem as it relates to memory here is we all have good natural memories. You know, think of, think of all the things we can actually remember. It's amazing mm-hmm. the way our, our minds work. Even if you say, oh, I've got a horrible memory. Uh, really? Do you, how many people do you know the names and faces of? Hundreds, thousands probably. How many statistics from your favorite sport do you, do you know? How many directions to how many different places? How many things do you know how to do from tying your shoes to, oh, you know what? That's right. My dad showed me how to fix that 40 years ago and oh now it's broke i know how to do that i think it yeah we did it this way we know so much it's a matter of helping our minds in a way they can they like and by focusing at one thing at a time giving it our attention our natural memory just kicks in that's what i'm all about i'm all about I mean, there are memory tricks and, and ways to help our minds and, and remember better and, and techniques. And I, I teach those and it's great. But kind of the low hanging fruit is just stop multitasking, sleep more, stress less, ask yourself, how am I going to remember that? And those simple things really can improve your memory dramatically, 50, 60% just with those things. And I think that sleeping more, you bring that up. I mean, I'm a night owl, as I've talked about before. I've written the night owl action plan, and I, I don't think it matters. I want to stress this, and maybe you can attest to it, or it doesn't. I think it's the matter of getting more sleep, not necessarily when you get the sleep. It's just getting getting Definitely. more sleep that matters. Um, I agree. The aging process. Now, we, I mean, I want to dive into the kids thing in a little bit here before we before we get closer to the to the wrap up. But I want to talk about you. You've written a post called "Memory Can Improve with at Any Age," and you've got an exercise yes. here, which I'm definitely going to share in the show notes because I think it's so. It how is that? Like, what is the science and, and how does that happen? Because most people have this idea that as they get older, they're not going to be able to remember as many things, and Part of me, the reason that I capture as much as I do, and maybe that's the balance that we want to strike, and I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about that in a minute, but is because I want, it, I want to remember the, the really important things. So I, I capture as much as I do so that the things that are really important stand out. Um, how, how is it possible that even as we age, where most people figure that, that my memory is the first thing that's going to go, how, do you, how mm-hmm. do you improve your memory as you get older? I look at it as we we mentioned earlier very much the same as is our as our physical body it's it's true it's just a fact of nature that as we get older we decline mentally physically but we can fight that just like the 60 70 80 90 year, old, 90 year olds who are participating in in crossfit or entering marathons or half marathons or 5k's or just getting up off the couch after dinner and turning the TV off and going for a walk. Just doing those simple things that we know we should do 
that helps us in our, our, our physical body. We stay active and our bodies last longer. And I think the last 30, 40, 50 years that science has been, has been coming more and more to the forefront of, hey, we've got to take care of our bodies. We've got to exercise. We've got to stay fit. It's not enough. You hit retirement age and now it's time to sit on the rocker on the porch. No, we've got to be out doing things with our body whatever whatever at our limit it is and the same thing now i think the the last 5 to 10 years and the next 10 to 20 years is going to be a, a similar advance in science about the mind and maintaining mental fitness so the same way we exercise our bodies we have to exercise our mind and as we get older a lot of people say crosswords or this or that and all of those work to some extent to keep the, the mind fit. And so the mind is kind of a big genre as, as saying physically fit is. But say you want to be, have a better uh, lung capacity, that's a very specific area of physical fitness. And when I say well, you want to have a better memory, then you need to go beyond kind of the general and more specific. And that is exercising your memory and just like if you're not used to it walking upstairs or going for a walk around the block if you're not used to it that's that's hard for us we need to do things that are hard for our memories so it's not enough to just just kind of well do the crossword puzzle and i get half of it done or two-thirds of it done or whatever that's that's good it is you're exercising your mind it's better if you do the crossword puzzle, finish as many as you can, and then the next day in the newspaper, you look at the answers you didn't get and you try to remember them because two, three months from now, there's going to be a similar clue and that's where you're going to try to pull it out and that's the exercise you need to do. So I advocate learning a foreign language, learning how to play an instrument you don't ever play not the one you tried to learn in high school or in grade school that your family forced upon you i've always wanted to learn to play the whatever and get it and try it and you know what as we get older things like that are hard and if it's hard for your mind that's a good thing it's it's your mind sweating the mental equivalent of sweating and we want to challenge ourselves if you can just remember something because you're really good at, at names that's great names is probably not the best way to exercise your mind it was exercise your memory so if you're bad at numbers maybe you start learning each of your kids's phone numbers every day instead of just having them programmed in your phone and then you learn okay well what's the not the emergency number, but what's the local hospital number? What's the grocery store's number? What You start memorizing numbers. If you're great with numbers, then you should probably switch to do something else. Memorize, memorize people's names. Meet more people and try to remember who they are. Anything that challenges our mind. And that's, that's really the key, is challenging ourselves to improve. Um, that's that's kind of what you're doing with the, with the podcast and the books is you know, helping people improve with their productivity and getting more done. That's what I'm trying to do with, with getting people to challenge their minds and remember better. Before we go, I want to talk about the idea of kids and memory. Um, and we're getting close yes. to wrap up time. But I wanted to make sure that we got to this because you've got a book called Unlock Your yes. Amazing Memory. The fun guide yes. that shows grades five to eight how to remember better and make school easier. Now, my daughter is in grade five right now. Right. And she is at the point where she, I mean, again, it does kind of help. She lives with a productivity strategist because she's good with to-do lists. <laughs> and, she's, and she's into capturing and, and things like that. And, I mean, even some of the life hacks. I'm like, did you forget your uh, backpack? Like, I go before you go to bed at night, put your backpack in front of your door. That way you will never, mm -hmm. like, in front of the front door and all that stuff. Um. We talked before we started recording about the need for these kind of activities to be kind of taught in school or for to be reinforced. Yes. Um, me with time management and task management, you with memory. How, why is it so important to hit them at this stage of the game rather than when they are, you know, older or is it, does it, like, is, is it just an easier sell? Is it, they're going to, I mean, obviously the benefits are probably going to be greater. Like, why did you decide mm -hmm. to go after this particular age group in terms of helping them and serving them as opposed to focusing on, say, seniors or, 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 or anything in particular like that? 
Certainly, as, uh, as you mentioned, a, a side part of my memory business is doing presentations for schools here in America. And mostly I do grades three through six. I do middle school and high school as well. But I like performing for the, the younger kids because they're impressionable. You know, they, they haven't decided for themselves. They haven't given up yet. They haven't decided, I don't know how to do this. I'm bad at school. Some of them might be getting there. Some of them might be struggling. But once you get a kid who's in high school, they, well, first of all, as we all know, because we, we've been there, once we reach a certain age, we know everything. Mm-hmm. And it's only once we get a little bit older that we start going, I don't know nearly as much as I think I do. I'm willing to learn. So the, the younger kids are more impressionable. They're, they're more willing to say, oh, I can remember better. Great. I had no idea. Show me how. Oh, I can be more productive. I don't have to lose my backpack. Great. Show me how. They're more willing. They're just, they're more willing, they're more interested. And that's true through about here here in the New York East Coast area, I've found through about sixth or seventh grade. Eighth graders, not as much. But interestingly enough, with, with the memory concepts, it is, it, it fades a little bit about ninth or tenth grade, but 11th or 12th grade in high school here, they, they really start going, wow, this is getting harder. I need to remember better. And it's it's possible. It's just that none of us have really been shown how to remember better. Now I know in from anecdotally from a couple of friends of mine in in law school they do. I don't know if they teach how to remember so much, but to succeed in law school you really have to be able to focus and remember a lot of information and retrieve it, retrieve it well. So I don't know if it's it's a matter of being taught in law school or just if you succeed, you've, you've figured it out on your own. But it's, it's something that everybody can get better at just with productivity. We can improve our memory. It's not hard. It's not boring. It's fun because we use either visual or audio and, and use our creativity to exaggerate things and color code them and add symbols and shapes. And it's, it's a blast and it has long-term benefits. Well, I, I definitely had a great time talking with you today, Brad. I mean, I think Me that I think, you, I think that this has been awesome, and I, I can't wait to share this with everyone. I hope everybody. I mean, I think that the big takeaway here is is that you know, I mean, don't memory is something that we. It's one of those things that we don't have to lose. We we can we can really get a grip on if we're willing to work at it. Just like you know, like you said earlier in, in in the discussion, you know, like like me trying to work out and get in better shape. You can do that with mm-hmm. your mind as well. And I think that, that there's a lot to be learned there. I, I strongly suggest people check out all the show notes that we offer today. Brad, where can people find you online when they want to? And, and by the way, everybody, try to remember this. Don't write it down. Try to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can write it down if you need to, but do try to remember it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bradzup.com. So think, think of me since you can't see me. Think that I'm just as handsome as Brad Pitt. I'm not, but think of Brad Pitt having given you all these great tips. And so that's the first name, Zup. You can think of a zebra with a whole bunch of balloons like in that Pixar movie, Up. And the zebra is just going up, up, up in the air. And there's a, there's a big pumpkin in the air because there's an extra P. So it's B-R-A-D-Z-U-P-P dot com. And if people want a free report, obviously there's, you know, this is 45, 50 minutes. There's not enough time to, to cover all the tips. But there's a free report, bradsup.com slash free report. I'm trying to make it easy here, folks. And they can, uh, they can check that. There's easy games you can do as you're, as you're driving around, driving the kids to school or driving home from work to practice exercising your memory. Um, there's other tips there. There's the three steps that we, we briefly talked about. And uh, that's, a, that's a great way. Also, the book is available on Amazon, Unlock Your Amazing Memory. And what the adults tell me is, I'm going to buy it for my kids or my grandkids or my niece or my nephew but I'm going to read it myself first. And they do and they love it. So it's definitely a, it's a silly book that kids will enjoy, but adults will like it because it's 84 pages and it's a quick read to get the basics down. Awesome. Brad, thanks so much for joining this, me this week on the Productivity Podcast. Thank you so much, Mike, and for all that you do to help me uh, learn how to be a little bit more productive each day myself. Another memorable episode 
of the Productivity Podcast is now in the books. Thanks to Brad for joining me on the show this week. And you can grab his free report. Just go to the show notes. And if you really like the show, I'd love it if you spread the word. You could either share this socially. You could subscribe in iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Anything you can do to support the show just to get more people listening to it would be absolutely awesome. In fact, I'll rely on you to remember that. Store that to memory in the spirit of this episode and then get it out there for the world to see. Now, if you don't want to just do that, you want to support the show monetarily and get exclusive content along with that, as well as the ability to gather in and and, uh, speak to me through our exclusive Slack community. And if you have more direct access to me and you'll be able to get some really cool perks, you can support the show as a Patreon supporter. Just head over to patreon.com slash productivityist. And that's where you can do just that. In fact, as we're releasing this episode, we would have just put out our monthly video exclusive to Patreon supporters. And Patreon supporters got an additional 10 minutes of content in this episode, if not a little bit more. So again, go to patreon.com slash productivity if you would like to pledge any dollar amount from $1 all the way up to the $50 mark and beyond. That is it for this week's episode. Before I go, I want to congratulate Lydia, Carly, and Andrew for winning the Todoist Premium six months for free. Uh, Hopefully, we'll have more contests like that down the line. I want to thank my podcast producer, John Polster, who never gets thanked enough for putting this show together. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, founder of Productivityist and Productivity Strategist, reminding you to stop guessing and start going.